the World Bank and EUCN to welcome you all to this discussion forum on change and adaptation in African drylands, reversing deforestation while contributing to food security. We are very glad that these two issues, focusing on drylands that have been not so strongly taken in, in red debates until today, and also issues related to a comprehensive landscape a perspective, especially the pressure regarding assuring food security, which is the first MDG, have been taken into Forest Day. And we know that we have asked our speakers to compress really very broad issues, but we are very uh, excited and have high expectation to what they are going to contribute to really both um, and related emerging issues. Deforestation and land degradation are threatening the livelihoods of millions of peoples in dryland Africa. And it's needed that this downward spiral of degradation is turned and the challenges uh, of climate change are met, supporting especially the livelihoods of the population. We will have now an hour and a half to focus on these three questions. What are the impacts that climate change uh, and land use changes will have for people and food security? How can this forest degradation be reversed? And what action have to be taken to scale up adaptation and mitigation success, especially where they have huge win-win opportunities? This discussion forum has been organized in conjunction, and I would highlight this issue with the session of the yesterday's Agricultural and Rural Development Day. More and more partners are insisting the CPF uh, to search for synergies between the Agricultural Day and the Forest Day with the aim of employing agroforestry and our techniques to build a stronger resilience and increase food security in this changing environment. The both events will explore the integration of forest and agriculture at a landscape approach and how they con contribute to a multifold uh, win on the food security uh, sphere, on climate change adaptation, on the energy issue, on water and soil protection, on livelihoods and on biodiversity. So we hope important and innovative messages come of this uh, debate with a strong engagement of the African uh, continent. I will, you will apologize me to turn over to Constance Neely as an agricultural expert working for FAO and the World Agroforest Center, ICRAF. She will moderate the session as unfortunately I cannot stay with you. It's really regrettable because I am uh, supposed to participate in a Rio Plus 20 uh, parallel event that is going in the same moment. So I wish you a very fruitful discussion and look forward to the drops reported later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for setting the stage for us this afternoon. We have a very brilliant panel today, and we're looking forward to having a very interactive discussion. And on that note, I would like to invite everyone who's sitting in the back to please come down into the front and center. It's really important that we sit closer so that we can interact more rapidly and hear your views. And we also have all these very cute voting machines down here. So please come on down. If I could encourage that or actually somehow facilitate that, I would really appreciate it. I'm very happy to, I would like to introduce um, all of the speakers that you're going to be hearing from this afternoon, and uh, then we're going to call on our keynote speaker. But we're very fortunate this afternoon to have Dr. Andrew Steer with us. He is the special envoy for climate change at the World Bank. He guides the World Bank group work on climate change efforts to support a very pro-development approach and agenda for climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation, now working in 130 countries. And the climate investment funds are at 6.5 billion US dollars. Prior to his appointment at the World Bank last year, you, many of you knew him as the Director General for Policy and Research at UK DFID. Following Andrew's presentation, we're going to have three discussants, and they've joined me up front. Uh, first will be Dr. Ben Chikamai, known to many of you. He's the director of the Kenya Forest Research Institute. He's executive secretary of the Network for Gum Arabic and Resins in Africa, the Ngama. He's also the regional coordinator for the Commonwealth Forestry Association, as well as IUFRO. 
Following Ben, we're going to hear from Dr. Mokhtar Toure, who is from Senegal. He's a soil scientist and a policy advisor. He's been serving most recently as a consultant to the UNDP, UNCCD, the Africa Development Bank, EFAD, and other West African countries. And prior to that, you knew him as a team leader for the World Bank and the Land and Water Resources Unit of the Jeff Program. And then our third discussant is going to be Dr. Robert Zugma More. He is the West Africa Regional Coordinator, Regional Program Leader for the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security Program, CCAFS, that it goes by, um, of the CGIAR. And prior to that, he was a senior staff within the environmental program of the Sahara and Sahel Observatory in Tunisia, the OSS. So that is going to be our group today. And with no further ado, I'd like to invite Andrew to provide our keynote presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Constance. Good afternoon to everybody. It's great to be here. Um, the other advantage of moving to the front is that you can keep each other warm as well. So. Um, uh, feel free to move around. This is a fantastic uh, building, and, and I think it's a, it's a great one, but uh, I think we're consuming quite a bit of carbon uh, air conditioning it at the moment. Um, I would like to congratulate uh, C4 and the other organizers of this remarkable forest day. Really a, a terrific occasion, as usual. Um, let me ask you two questions. Question number one, as everybody knows, uh, forests emit more greenhouse gases than all transportation in the world combined. All aeroplanes, all cars, all trains, all public transportation combined. We're establishing a green fund now, which we hope will be large. Do you think transportation or forests will get more money out of the green fund? Well, I'll tell you the answer transportation will get a lot more money out of the Green Fund. And yet forests actually not only have a massive mitigation function, they also have a huge adaptation function. So let's try to change that and let's try to make sure that actually forests get at least as much and probably more, hopefully, than transportation. Let me ask you another question, one of the, the great Parts of my job I enjoy is, is overseeing the climate investment funds, which are implemented by the regional development banks and the World Bank. They're large funds, 6.5 billion. Let me ask you this. Imagine we've got two projects going to the board. One, a $300 million program of support for public transportation in Mexico City to make things more fuel efficient. Then you've got another program, let's say $20 million for forests in Burkina Faso. Which do you think the board will spend more time arguing over? Well, 10 to 1 in terms of the time given probably to Burkina Faso forestry, even although it was only one-tenth of the money to Mexico. Now, why is that? Well, I think there's several reasons. One of which is we haven't done a very good job at really telling a narrative. We also separate forests from agriculture too much, and Burkina Faso was basically regarded as not really having enough trees. Therefore, why would you have a forest project there? We also separate mitigation from adaptation. And so the Burkina Faso work actually is really a fabulous project if one really brings the mitigation and adaptation together. So those two questions I want sort of just to keep in the back of your mind to sort of frame what we're talking about now because we're not just having an academic conversation among practitioners and specialists here we're actually in the midst of a political process with big implications. 
And it seems to me that one of the nice things of having the Forest Day sitting alongside the negotiations is that we as the forest community actually can play quite an important role. But only if we agree on a compelling narrative, I believe the narrative for forests, especially surprisingly in dry lands, is truly compelling. So what I want to do today is actually not tell you a whole lot of things you don't know, although I hope some of the things you'll think, well, oh, that's interesting, but more to sort of see if we can agree on a storyline that actually can then empower our engagement uh, in the policy, the political, and the financial realm. So just the sort of basic starting points here, I think people know the facts, seven billion people in the world, one billion of them live in Africa, two billion in the world live in dryland areas, 1.5 billion are dependent on degrading land. Losses from climatological effects are huge, 7.5 billion growing very rapidly. And uh, to compare the area of land that's uh, under dry lands, the two billion, total agricultural land, 4.9 billion. Now here's the final point, compare the number in the second row, 1 billion today, to 3.4 billion people living in Africa in 2050. And we all know that the IPCC and many other studies have shown that actually parts of Africa will get significantly hotter than the average, and you see that in those bright red marks on the left. And similarly, Africa will be affected in a highly differentiated way with regard to rainfall, and you see it both the north and the south, uh, less rainfall and probably in the middle, more rainfall. Africa is already heating up. As you know, scientific evidence suggests 0.7 degrees in the last uh, 30 years, and that's uh, quite significant. Two weeks ago, I was in the Becker Valley with some farmers and some scientists there, they see a well over one degree rise already. Those farmers are already suffering quite seriously through pest infestation and other reasons. And we all know also that yields could be very, very seriously affected. And if you look at that's the world as a whole, and Africa has a lot more red on it than other continents and is likely to be uh, very severely affected. I should say that there is some good news potentially for some parts of Africa, particularly in the center, where a combination of possibly better rainfall and more carbon fertilization could actually lead to increase in yields. But on average, you've all seen the numbers and the threats are very great. Now, it's worth pointing out that Africa has had very, very serious floods in the past, five times over the last 1,000 years. Have there been, if you like, what you could call mega droughts? I think I said floods, I meant droughts. Starting with the granddaddy of them all uh, between uh, uh, 1,000 and 1,200 uh, years ago, where you see, the, you see the numbers there, and five since then. Now, why is that uh, important? It's important because over the centuries, Africa has actually learned a lot about adaptation because it's needed to. And we need to learn from what farmers and African citizens have learned over the last thousands of years. And one of the most important things that Africans learned very early on is that trees are a very, very vital part of the entire adaptation story. But obviously, they can't play the role in adaptation if they don't exist anymore. And if you look, for example, in the southern part of Africa at the uh, Miombo area, you'll see that in the last 15 years, the five countries of that dryland belt, that's Malawi, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, have reported about 175,000 square kilometers of lost forests, partly due to weather patterns, 
but also due to urban needs for wood fuel, which once again illustrates how wrong we have the climate change discussion, because the 65% of African households who don't have electricity today should be absolutely front of the queue in order to receive climate finance. Why? Because if they don't get climate finance, if they don't get electrification from sustainable sources, the problem will get much, much worse, not just on the carbon emission side, but on the adaptation side, and we are imposing a cruel future on Africa if we do not put energy access very high up on the agenda. Do you know the estimates are that uh, poor families spend a lot more on lighting their homes than rich families? And you know why? It's because they have to buy solid fuel, or liquid fuel actually, in the case of lighting, paraffin. The estimates are that if you take liquid and solid fuel, over $17 billion is spent a year by poor families on these fuels. So, back to the storyline, woodlands and forests play a key role in building resilience into farming systems in at least four ways. And I think you know these ways, but it's important as we look, for example, at dry land forests, which the untrained eye would look at, and they would say, well, they're just sitting there, doing really nothing. But in fact, they are playing a truly vital role in resilience, and you all know why. Number one, woodland products generate income of 10 to 50 percent. C4 and the World Bank have done a lot of work on this, as you know. Um, and the amount, if you include not only what is a cash income, but you include what a household uses for itself, poor households can rely on woodland products for around 54% of everything they use. So that's number one. Number two, woodlands act as crucial safety nets. In, for example, the eastern province in Kenya, just a few months ago, farmers who had been hit by the drought resorted to the dryland forests to produce charcoal that they could sell just to survive. Households which have access to woodlands are more resilient to shocks from illnesses and from climatic events, and they recover from these events faster than households which don't have access to woodlands. So their role as a safety net is crucial and it's vital that those that run social safety net programs, financial ones, understand the role of nature as a very, very vital complement. Number three, woodlands reduce income inequality, which in and of itself has been found to show, found to improve a resilient. Monica Fisher, studying the Miombo dependency in Malawi, found out that income distributional disparities fell by 12% if families had access to these woodlands. Will Cavendish and Bruce Campbell um, in Zimbabwe found that woodland-derived income has a substantial and equalizing effect on rural income distribution. In southern Zimbabwe, among the poorest households, nearly 30% of income is woodland-based. So third, as part of the resilience story, we need to be able to convey how woodlands reduce income inequality. And then finally, and sort of most all-embracing of all, woodlands obviously are a total vital part of an integrated farm, forest, li and livestock system. For livestock, for example, I mean, late in the dry season, miombo leaves fall at a time when fodder has disappeared. And so they are a totally vital part of the fodder and grazing cycle, if you like. And in large parts of southern Africa, leaf litter is collected from woodlands and composted, composted and dug into agricultural fields. So woodlands far from just sitting there, are vital, as everyone in this room knows, for at least four reasons relating to resilience. 
Now, one of the great themes of yesterday and today is that foresters need to have one foot in the forest proper, but at least another foot outside of the forest. Because whilst we have tended to segment our professions, in fact, we need to think of landscapes rather than forests versus agriculture. And one of the great things about the launch today of the CGIAR research program on forests, trees, and agroforestry is precisely that it recognizes this and hopefully will help us all to understand things better. Now, look, uh, you have heard and you have spoken yourself and many of you have written about the abundant opportunities for what we now all call triple win in agriculture that comes about from trees. And the triple win, first, there are smart trees out there. There are trees that sequest, that put nitrogen into the soil. And there are some that are so clever that actually they organize their leaf cycle so that it actually is win-win to everybody. I mean, not only do some of these trees I told you about drop their leaves when the cattle need them, but other trees actually lose their leaves when you need the sun. I mean, it's amazing um, how clever they are, and most people don't understand that. And so all of you here know more about Phyderbia than I do, but just look at the red circled ones there. You can choose. Without the trees, you get 2.6 tons per hectare of maize. With a few trees, you get 5.6. Your choice. But clearly, this sort of win-win is something that we've got to bring alive to negotiators. So the second part of the triple win, all of you know, and I don't even need to really explain it, how trees can build uh, resilience. There's a growing evidence that the right trees planted on farms can build resilience by creating conditions for dry season cropping. And the third element of the triple win, and I hope your eyes are better than mine, uh, is what it does for soil carbon. And uh, yes, it's complicated. Yes, we don't know everything. But yes, evidence is growing year by year that actually um, trees are even more powerful at sequestering carbon in agricultural areas than some of the things we talk about a lot, such as mulching and zero tillage and so on. And down there, um, I, you don't need to, you probably can see it with your young eyes, you will actually see that all of these different aspects of agroforestry add a little more than the others. And so, you know, whether it's one ton per acre per year in Africa for the next five or six years, but you imagine if you add all that together, what it could do. This is just, look at this, just imagine five million hectares, which is just the beginning, if you like. Think of three values there. Value number one, the nitrogen fertilizer that will be brought into the soils, worth 500 million a year. Value number two, the amount of additional maize and the value thereof, a billion to a billion and a half a year. And then think of the additional carbon sequestered, 30 to 50 million tons per year, which is worth another 450 to 1.25, according to whatever the price of carbon might be. This is, um, this is remarkably exciting stuff, and you are all on the frontiers of it, so I hope you are uh, thrilled um, by the role that you can all play. Now, the other important thing in dealing with negotiators is to explain that actually success is possible. One of the most important things that we all can do to help negotiators make the progress they need to is to demonstrate success is possible at scale, at reasonable cost, um, and benefiting the poor. And the great thing is that farmers actually know a lot about how to grow trees already, and that's why, that's why there is huge scope for um, scaling up and restoring areas. And those in the negotiations who are still saying it's too complicated, we can say, well, actually, no, it's not. Farmers actually know how to do it. And we now have a lot of evidence 
that about 700 million hectares uh, within Africa could be restored. And the Global Partnership for Forest Landscape Restoration has played a, a very, very significant role, not only in the analysis, but also in the communication um, of this fact. Now, how would we go about this? Well, you know this as well as I do. Um, if you successfully devolve responsibilities and add clarity at the local level, you can turn the Humbo program in Ethiopia from that to that, you know. And, well, let me do that again. From that to that. It's great, eh? And this was the first project ever, and World Vision and World Bank and others have been an important part of that, but the Ethiopian government actually deserves the credit and the communities even more than the credit. More than 90% of the Humbo project area has now been reforested through strategies that involved the devolution of responsibility to community institutions and the use of far, farmer managed natural forest regeneration techniques. And not only do they have trees, they have more honey, they have more fruit. The first large scale forestry project in Africa to be registered with the UNFCCC. And it's just the beginning. And you've seen. Um, other examples uh, of, of just smart policies leading to huge change. Niger was already mentioned today more than once. 1993, the rules regulating the use of trees on farms were revised, giving farmers a freer hand and stronger incentive to grow trees. And these rules simply made it clear that actually the communities owned the trees and not the government. Niger created a simple land registration system, giving farmers more confidence. And after two decades, over five million hectares of parkland tree farming systems have been rejuvenated. And uh, this has benefited 4.5 million people. Sorghum yields have increased 20 to 85 percent. Millet yields between 15 and 50 percent. Remarkable uh, what can be done with smart policies. And as a result, many farms in, this is in West Africa, actually now have 20 times more trees on them than they did 20 years ago. It's really quite remarkable. There are more trees outside of forest areas, whilst in many forest areas there are less trees. So the distribution of trees has been shifting quite substantially. Now, obviously, private actors are, at the end of the day, whether they are small farmers or whether they're small businesses, will be key players. And what we're seeing is that as local economies grow, demand for poles and other things uh, grow, and the question is, is there a regulatory environment in which the private sector can invest in forests and also make money out of it at the same time? And what we're seeing is some quite exciting things. Here's an uh, area of Kenya that's uh, desperately dry. Um, what role would a modern company have there? Well, actually, there's a, a tree there called the mukau that can produce beautiful and, and valuable hardwood. It's a bit like mahogany. They're coming in. They're planting this tree. It grows in 15 to 20 years' time. But they will only do it if they get the right kind of regulatory environment. And so we foresters, obviously, have to spend time in departments of private sector development and trade and industry just as much as we do in the department of forestry. And so we're seeing that markets can create incentives for better woodland and uh, tree management. And so this is, this is something where uh, there's still a large research agenda to understand precisely ca how can governments create an environment in which the private sector will play a positive contribution in these difficult and arid areas. Another point that's obvious, but I simply make it because I'm trying to paint a picture which shows forests, dryland forests, as absolutely integral to the entire development process. And all we're learning about development policy, such as good governance, applies to this 
just as much. Throughout Africa, countries that have the strongest framework for good governance consistently generate more private investment, and this is true for investing in trees and in landscape restoration, as investors need to have confidence. And finally, public institutions need to be more effective. And so again, when we talk about money available from climate finance, this needs to think about the, the whole story and all of the instruments that are required, including here relating to agricultural extension and so on. Look, we need to scale up things pretty significantly. Sorry, the map's not very legible here. We need more initiatives like we're seeing at the moment being launched, the Great Green Wall, 100 million from the GEF, uh, 1.8 billion in co-financing. We need to create a political sense. Essentially, the Great Green Wall is a series of 11 countries doing smart things relating to landscape management in dry areas. But by adding it together and calling it the Great Green Wall, it is building a political storyline which is exciting politicians, exciting parliaments who have to allocate money, and exciting delegates to the convention here. So we've got to think politically as well as practically, and we've got to learn across countries. And we've got to put all these things together. Sometimes people say, it's so complicated. You know, there's a private sector, social investors, climate funds, farmers, government budgets. It's all too complicated. Much better to spend climate money in building a renewable energy power plant, which is straightforward. Well, yes, you need to do that, but you also need to explain and be able to explain how the whole thing fits together. So a final slide, making it happen here in Durban. There are extremely clear negotiation objectives that um, need to be addressed. Uh, you're all aware of the um, subject matter that's being discussed with regard to baselines and so on under red, so that needs to be done here. Second, and much more difficult, agriculture needs to be incorporated fully under the convention. Um, and we need to increasingly blur the distinction between forests and agriculture. This has less than a 50% chance of being done this week. It's a great sadness, but there's still some resistance. We need to be getting out there and explaining why it would be good to have a work program on agriculture under the Substa that doesn't put agriculture into the basket of mitigation or the basket of adaptation, but looks at the whole thing holistically and looks at dry land forestry in the same way it looks at any other kind of forestry. And finally, we just need to get a narrative that explains that we're moving from a distinction that separates forests from farms to something that is much more holistic, that looks at triple win landscapes. Let me finally recommend to you um, a couple of books which are available to everybody. And I want to give Peter DeWeese, uh, who actually told me everything I just said, he told me what to say, basically. No, <laughs> um, this is a really great piece of work on the, on the uh, Miombo woodlands. There's also this very nice one, Investing in Trees and Landscapes. I look forward very much to the discussion we're about to have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. I don't think you just painted a picture. I believe that was a masterpiece. You've managed to both um, develop the story about the severity of the situation in these extensive dryland situations, as well as to paint a very nice picture of hope. And we're very grateful. But you've also created a feast of jumping off points, so our discussants have plenty to work with. Um, and so we look forward now to hearing from our three discussants. We'll start with Ben Chikamai, and we look forward to your insights and reactions. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank you very much. I think Andrew has given a very elaborate exposition on the changes that are taking place on this particular continent with the advent of climate change, the initiatives that are actually being undertaken and the measures and the way forward. What I'm going to do is to try and fill in with practical examples and experiences that actually have taken place. And I would like to say that um, 
initiatives have been undertaken in this particular region, that's Africa, where there has been quite a reversal in the aspect related to reversing deforestation and of course land degradation while ensuring actually food security. One practical example that we have is the project that was undertaken by FAO in 2004 to 2008 in collaboration with the regional network for natural gums and resins. This was a project which was formulated specifically to try to contribute sustainable development, enhance food security, while of course mitigating the certification and with it the climate change. And it was a project that was undertaken in six countries, beginning with Senegal, in Burkina, in Niger, in Chad, Sudan, and of course in, in, in Kenya. And it involved an aspect of actually integrating the tree component into the crop and livestock farming systems. And this one here involved particularly using the mechanized water harvesting, where they were trying to actually undertake, uh, uh, prepare micro catchments using actually the mechanized water harvesting, the Valarani technology, as well as the conventional methods that were actually undertaken within a span of about five meters uh, in rows, and trees were actually planted within the micro catchments, and in between the, the rows, we had either crop components, particularly we had the uh, crops like uh, the, the we are quite a, a range of socum, we had socum, we had actually millet, and we had also maize, cow peas that were actually planted. The tree component comprised largely the Acacia Senegal, as well as Acacia Sial, and the cam resin species. At the end of it, at the end of the three years actually of the establishment of this particular project, when an evaluation was done, it was found out that about 11,000 hectares were actually planted with the trees and fairly successfully. And when you look at that, you find that it was a massive aspect of actually tree planting that was very, very useful. Secondly, and much more important, is that the capacity of the local people was fully, fully enhanced. And we had in areas like in Kenya, where we had actually communities that are predominantly pastoralists beginning to practice agriculture. Their lifestyles completely changed. They began to embrace actually farming. And when you went to check on the social impact, you found out that they began even to eat some of the vegetables that were not actually in their predominant lifestyles that were previously before. That was something that was quite significant. The second aspect that emerged from this particular project and one that is of significance is the fact that the livelihoods of these particular communities did improve. It improved tremendously through the capacity building program and sustainability of the dry land ecosystems, particularly involving the local communities and enhancing their capacity, resulted in a very good improvement of the, 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 the livelihoods where now they are able to actually sell the commodities, particularly the gums, the resins, the indigenous fruits, which they were, and even medicinos, as actually a safety net, as well as a livelihood strategy. One of the things that come out is that yes, when you incorporate tree component into a, a crop as well as livestock components, you are able to enhance the resilience. And this is actually what uh, Andrew has been able to demonstrate and has been able to say. The second aspect that I would like to be able perhaps to look at, and the one that I would like to be able to add, is that out of this particular project, we have had lessons learned. And one of the things is that there are very good practices of integrating trees into crop as well as livestock farming systems, which need to be actually upscaled. We have noted that the mechanized wood harvesting is a very successful technology because it's able to rehabilitate vast areas of land within a very short period of time. For example, you are able to rehabilitate about 10 hectares within a day using actually the mechanized wood harvesting system. This is actually a, a practice that we need to upscale 
because it's working, and particularly for the dry lands of Africa, which are really vast, where, of course, manual methods are actually limiting in terms of the area you can be able to cover. And this is what we intend to be able to upscale in the main phase, which has been actually developed, trying to look at the best practices of the technology and how we can be able to actually use it in a more effective manner. This is a project, again, where the FAO is going to, as we have formulated, and we are working closely with the regional network, which is going to be able to clearly enhance the aspects of this particular technology, even to a larger scale. The project is currently at a resource mobilization stage, and we do hope that very soon, of course, it will be able to get the financing that is really required. In terms of how can we be able to, what strategies do we need to do? At the national level, particularly with climate change, we need to be able to come up with very clear national strategies. I do know that in my country, we have already a national strategy on climate change. We have undertaken a red preparedness program, and this is something that needs to be actually undertaken. At sub-regional and regional level, we need to be able to try and actually look at the best practices that can be scaled up. And more importantly, we need to recognize the fact that the political goodwill is very important. For example, within the sub-region, we are having, of course, and my colleague is going to speak on the Great Green Wall of the Sahara and Sahel Initiative. It's a drive that has actually taken a political goodwill. And with that, we should be able to move forward so that we can be able to build on this particular project and the best practices. And more importantly, particularly when you are trying to look at the aspect of livelihood and sustainability, we have to be able to try and see how best we can be able to establish clear markets for the communities in a way that can be able to enhance the marketing of the commodities and that will be able to result in a fairly good cash income. So very briefly, I'd just like to be able to say that uh, there are practical examples with the best practices we have and I'm quite sure that if we take this ones on board, we shall be able to ensure the reversal in terms of the degradation while ensuring the food security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you for reinforcing the points about that there's not a line between the forest and these integrated systems, that they are all part of a holistic approach, and for reminding us about the market value. At this point, may we hear from Mokhtar, please. Thank you very much, Constance. I would like to shape my contribution around three uh, illustrative uh, cases drawn from uh, ongoing experiences at community, national, country, and regional level across the, Saharan, the Sahelian belt. The first element drawn for, uh, draw from the finding, conclusions, and recommendation from the first African Dryland Weeks held in Dakar this year, and whose objective was to review the challenges posed by land degradation, desertification, and climate change, to share and discuss the lessons and experience, and to explore opportunities and modality for scaling up successes. The most striking finding is the existence of many spot of three base successes and hope in the midst of one of the most harsh environment and health, thanks to the resilience, creativity, and vitality of the communities whose life revolve around crops, trees, and livestock. I've noted five points that underpin the successes. Number one, trees are back in big numbers into the landscapes. After the severe drought hit of the 70s, and this is done mainly, this has been done mainly through natural 
and assisted re regeneration. The Federbia story, the regeneration process in uh, Niger, in uh, Mali, and in Senegal are the most vivid example we have. But similar cases can be found in East Africa, in Zambia, in Malawi, in Tanzania, and Ethiopia. Second, homemade institutional arrangements are very critical in uh, making these successes. And um, they ensure an effective tree management and uh, livestock and ag agriculture conflict resolutions and linkages to market. And among those uh, home uh, uh, arrangements, we have village action plans, rural procedures, management committees, policy enforcement units, fieldwood markets, many. But I think the most critical point is the government policy and regulatory instrument that have been revised and adapted to uh, support the tree expansion uh, process. In Niger, positive changes in tree and land and power ownership and tenure has been a critical factor. I think this uh, ownership and, and, and change in tenure is extremely important. Last but not least, women are assuming a greater leadership role in all segments of the community revival uh, process. Outstanding challenges and obstacles to our consolidation and, and upscaling include, indeed, adequate access to technology to expand and to accelerate the natural regeneration process, and indeed the absence of an enabling and supportive policy environment that will help to broaden access to market and financial services. The second element refers to the Senegal's experience in intervillage forest and pastoral resource management strategy. To cope with land degradations and deforestation trends, several villages are joining effort to protect and improve the quality of shared communal lands through a variety of conservation and management techniques. The successful strategy combining an assisted regeneration of com combretum glute glutinosum using an improved agroforestry nursery, similar to the one used uh, uh, by uh, the uh, ICRAF uh, through the uh, concept of resource uh, center, with a total protection of the reserve area is a case in point in Senegal. But, among, but above and beyond the many implementation, implementation issues faced by the community, they have realized the value of pulling together their resources and effort uh, beyond the boundary of their respective villages. They can't just make it by themselves. They need to come together, pull effort, and work together. They also realize the importance to be inclusive, to include women, youth, and indeed the transhuman herders that are a critical player in those landscapes. And they have also realized the need for strong and effective management structure, uh, structures and tools uh, at the multi-village scale. So, need for code of conduct, for multi-village governance structures, uh, linkage with, governance, uh, with local government, I think uh, were extremely uh, important issues. Outstanding constants still include the slow evolution of the forest service repressive act attitude. They are still around, acting like gendarme. And uh, even though there are some uh, uh, positive trend in some countries. 
We also note that there is some disruptive role of certain social uh, religious structures that are also uh, 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 constraining the, the, the process. But above all, it's the lack of effective decentralization and empowerment of local, of, of local structure. There is a lot of talk, but very uh, few walk to the talk. But this growing number of uh, successful uh, cases have prompted uh, some government uh, uh, to develop national strategy, mentioned already by uh, 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 Ben, to promote and to guide the agroforestry development. And I think uh, uh, in addition to Kenya, Niger is uh, leading the pack, but similar cases can be uh, found in Senegal, Tanzania, and Ethiopia, just to, to name few. The third and final element refer to what uh, Andrew, you were mentioning about the green, uh, green, uh, uh, Great Green Wall, which is indeed uh, a political commitment across border to provide a broader framework uh, for the promotion of a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder, and multidisciplinary approach to sustainable land management and na land and natural resource management at this landscape scale. Planning intervention includes sustainable forest management, forest landscape restoration, agroforestry and farmer managed natural regenerations. Despite the uh, initial skepticism, the initiative is gaining some momentum and impetus. National and regional management structure has been put in place with the support of uh, some agencies uh, such as uh, FAO and other partners, national strategy and action plan has been uh, developed. And uh, international collaboration also is uh, trying to harmonize uh, its, uh, its, uh, its, its contributions. The, ch the challenge are as great as the promises. The main issue are the limited scientific and, and technical capability and financial base of the initiative. Second, it's the narrow agroecological boundaries set uh, for the initiative at the onset, it's just 15 kilometers. And uh, there is a need for greater coordination among the external partners and among the, Afrin of <coughs> among the African regional and sub-regional entities. But there is a high hope that this barrier will be unlocked very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mokhtar. And thanks for driving home the points around ownership and governance and some of the constraints we face, but also the opportunity that the Great Green Wall holds for us to show the political will across national boundaries. Thank you very much. Now, may I invite Robert to give us a few insights, probably related to research. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Constance. Um, I think uh, all the panelists uh, who already talked have clearly shown that Africa has developed skills in adaptation. And the regreening of the soil have been several times uh, mentioned. It's not only Niger, because today, we have some significant cases in Burkina, in Mali, that shows clearly the regreening of the Sahel. And I would like to tap on this to show what can be the importance of research in terms of uh, uh, accompanying this initiative in order to ensure a, a sustainable, let's say, a climate smart options uh, that can be upscaled across the whole region. But before that, let me recall a little bit uh, that this is an initiative this, that is clearly farmer-led innovation. It's a farmer-led innovation, and this is the reason why we don't talk too much about research there. And it is important to explore this, uh, this component uh, of, of the initiative. So this, basically, this initiative has consisted in protecting 
uh, the different uh, trees that appeared in the farm uh, land, and it is selected according to the needs and the objective of the farmer. And this has allowed increasing the availability of water uh, to people, to crop, to livestock, and even to trees. And this has also increased crop production and food security for a growing population. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, 500,000 ton per year of crop uh, of production uh, that have happened in Niger. So the evidence is there. But we have to agree that indeed the research component came later uh, in order to investigate what happened and also to try uh, document a little bit. Then I will emphasize on this aspect. What can be the role of research? In my viewpoint, the first thing is that research should try to document clearly in a scientific manner, in a more comprehensive uh, way, all these kind of initiatives that are working and that are farmer-based. And we have to clearly uh, determine what are the reasons for the successful impact, Biophica, biophysical uh, factors, socioeconomical factors, these are very crucial in the perspective of the upscaling of these practices. Researchers should also try to determine the condition for sustaining these practices and, and taking into consideration the dimension of climate change that is hardening, I think, the condition of success of these practices. So, there are also some opportunities and the potential for carbon sequestration, for instance, regarding this uh, farmer-managed tree regeneration is not yet known. So it's important that research try to investigate on this aspect in order to develop some tools that will help and inform the decision making uh, for the national uh, decision makers. We have to also continue de uh, de uh, de developing options that are climate smart, uh, that are climate smart. Uh, and as Andrew mentioned, it should be the, uh, the, the triple win that will guide our intervention uh, with this kind of options I'm talking about. And it should integrate crops and trees. It should not be uh, agriculture on, on, in one part and uh, forestry in another. This is over. And we have to, as I said, we have to suggest tools and measures that will allow improving the resilience while contributing to the mitigation of climate change and the preservation of biodiversity. And again, we have to explore and develop some agroforestry options that will increase the soil carbon uh, and think about the enrichment of parklands because we are in a very severe environment, very harsh conditions, and it is important to bring some new uh, parameters that will increase the potential of productivity of this environment. And it's important that we as scientists and researchers we think about enriching uh, these uh, parklands, free bringing in some new uh, genetic materials and so on. And these are the things we have to think about if we would like to sustain this kind of successful practices uh, that are really helpful uh, in terms of attaining the food security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert, and also bringing in the multiple ecosystem processes and this evidence base that is going to be required to show the value that we can make a change. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from four wonderful actors, and right now we have to do about 35 minutes worth of work in about 15. So I think we're going to fast forward here and start to hear what's bubbling up in your minds. First of all, um, 
Can I use this mic down here? Okay, it's time for us quickly to register who's in the room. So if you're down here, you have access to one of these, please pick it up and let me read to you the one question so our panelists know who they're talking to, who they're gonna be discussing with. Choose the option that best characterizes the organization that you represent today at Forest Day. Private sector, NGO, government, international organization, academic research, or other. You have 10 seconds. How did we do? All right, we've got some academics in the room and also a solid contingent of NGOs. That's fantastic. So we have a nice distribution. Of, uh, of our audience. So now let me ask you, because we're gonna try and get as much information out of you as possible so that our panelists can come back to you, I'd like you to turn to the closest person to you and share one insight, one reaction that you have to the four speakers that you've just heard from. You've got one minute, so share an insight quickly. What struck you? You're going to give me one. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Has everybody got their insight sorted? Or a question or a concern? All right. We've got a runner on both sides. And let's take three reactions or comments to our colleagues. We're going to start here. We're going to come here next. Is there a third one in the wings? All right. Let's start here. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, yes, thank you. My name is Marku Aho. I come from Finland. I discussed with my uh, neighbor here, and we identified that one of the burning, maybe the most burning issue is not a technical one, uh, because there are technical solutions, but it's a governance issue. Um, the, the African population will double uh, pretty soon. And right now, uh, to my understanding, 70% of African uh, rural farmers are <coughs> women. That, uh, because the number of, of uh, female farmers in the African environment will double, it becomes an even more pressing governance issue to uh, have a gender-specific approach to, to dissemination of technologies and <coughs> empowering empowering the rural communities, like the panelists have already indicated. The, <clears throat> the problem is not that the farmers would not know how to, to work on land and how to integrate trees uh, and, and other woody plants to farming systems. It becomes uh, uh, more urgently a governance issue to, for, uh, <clears throat> to address the most <clears throat> pressing needs. Thank you very much, Marku. Please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Arthur Heidegger from France, and I'm both academic and NGO. So I, I've uh, 
a question and a, a burning remark. Uh, I think that all of you have not insisted enough of putting the agriculture in red plus. And uh, uh, they all, all of you say that agriculture should be in. But what are you really doing to have it in? And you told, me, uh, you told us that uh, uh, there is still resistance about putting agriculture in red plus. So you should explain a little bit more why there are resistance and what you are doing to overcome this resistance, because that's very important. We have been starting, you know, it's the fifth day for Forest Day, and we have insisted to have an agricultural day, and we only started in Copenhagen. We should have done it five years earlier. And so you should thought the foresters are still thinking in, it's just about trees, about getting at the people and food. So you, it's time to come back to the real situation, and it's, it's possible now. There's a, there's a letter which is, to be, is going to be sent to the, to the COP to incorporate uh, agriculture, and if you are not trying hard enough, it will not be done. So it's your responsibility. Okay, thank you very much. One more question? Yes? Could we have a mic here, please? Thank you. My name is Thomas Seifert, Stellenbosch University, South Africa. I think we as scientists, and I dare to speak for my fellow scientists here as well, <laughs> is uh, that we have failed in putting the level in between the grassroots results of scientific level and the policy level. And this is the regional planning level. We don't make that results visible to planners and to uh, decision makers. So we need a more holistic landscape management. We need to have decision support tools that boil down the information to an essence that can be understood by a decision maker. And we have to feed that tools with all our results that we gather in the next years and we, that are already gathered. So that is just a comment that I wanted to, to point out here. Very kind. I think you might have some researchers that are with you on that. Okay, let's hear from our panelists. The first query was around really getting at this governance and gender. And Mokhtara, you mentioned it specifically. Do you want to come back on that or does someone else want to add? Go ahead, Mokhtar. Hit it hard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I, I think we are really uh, uh, giving lip services to uh, the issue of, uh, of gender. Uh, even though we have uh, evidence on the ground that um, women are really uh, coming up and uh, taking a, a much bigger and stronger role in uh, the revival process, as I mentioned. It. And this is not just specific to, uh, to the rural areas. I think in all segments of our society, women are coming up. But unfortunately, it is not supported by um, by, by, by effective and, uh, and um, strong uh, policy and political commitment in reality. Uh, it, it is happening by itself. Uh, indeed, in some places you can see uh, some instrument put in place, but really looking at um, the global picture throughout the continent, it is not supported by uh, commitments. Thank you very much, Mokhtar. Andrew, can I ask you to speak to how we're going to fast track this agriculture piece? Well, you raise a very good question. Um, number one, why, why is there resistance to it? Um, well, you remember pre the Bali COP, there was a lot of resistance to forests as well and the whole red agenda and the argument went sort of, it's too complicated. I mean, my goodness me, it's difficult enough to do all the other things. What about baselines, the counterfactuals, how do you measure it, whole range of issues. That was four years ago now, um, and I think due to a huge amount of work, we're now, we've made huge progress, I and mean, uh, we're not there yet, but, uh, but I think the, the battle has largely been won. What's the problem now with agriculture? Well, partly the same. There's a, there's a view of this is just too complicated. Um, and how do we measure carbon in the soil and all this kind of thing? And how could you have millions and millions of farmers? How would you ever sort of, you know, 
and so on. And th there's too quickly a link to carbon markets. I don't know why. I mean, carbon markets could eventually relate to this, but that's not really what it's about. The main criticism is, is this. It is a fear on the part of some G77 countries, particularly agricultural exporting countries, they fear that, um, that down the road, if agriculture is fully included, including the emissions side of the equation, then down the road there could be some sort of limits put on certain agricultural techniques um, and maybe even trade sanctions put on and so on. And so that's the criticism. Now, um, is that a good criticism? No, but you can understand why it's there. Um, what are we doing about it? Well, um, the South Africans, as you know, are, are major proponents of change. Tina Jumat Patterson, the Minister of Agriculture here, is obsessive about this in a very wonderful way. Um, we worked with her to convene a meeting of agricultural ministers from throughout Africa uh, in, in September. Uh, that led immediately that meeting. We then flew to Bamako, um, where there was the meeting of AMSEN, all the environment ministers of Africa. Some of us there brought the, delegate, the, uh, the de declaration, including Minister Malewa, who is the Minister of Environment from South Africa. She went and gave an impassioned statement, presented the declaration that came from the ministers of agriculture here. And the ministers of environment there from Africa actually said, well, this sort of makes sense. We're sort of on your side. But interestingly, when it gets down then to the negotiators, they very quickly say, well, it's, I don't think so, not this year. I mean, it's just too, it's, it's too difficult. We've got so much else on our plate. I mean, there's the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, there's the Green Fund. I mean, we just can't give the airtime that this would deserve. And then you also have some who are really actively opposing it for some of the reasons that I said. So, you know, what are we doing? We're just one small player. One of the things that we're doing on Wednesday, we are convening a meeting. Um, Kofi Annan is flying here for one purpose only, to argue on this point. He's coming for four hours, and he is coming on the issue of, of agriculture. Um, President Zuma will be there. Prime Minister Meles will be there. Um, uh, a whole range of, 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 uh, of leading uh, speakers uh, uh, will be there. Mary Robinson will be there, Josette Sheeran will be there, all making the case as clearly as they possibly can that this needs to take place. But there's still a lot to play for. There's still five more days on this COP, uh, and this, the being Africa's COP, is the time to really make progress. And what one's wanting is not very much, quite frankly. One wants a work program under Substa. One wants it to be recognized in a holistic way and not just under adaptation. So, um, so let's see. But it, it, I mean, you put the challenge on me. You somehow <laughs> said it was our job. Well, we're working as hard as we possibly can. We're also convening some, some, uh, some negotiators. Last night, there was a dinner for all uh, negotiator champions on this subject to try and move it forward. But I'd also put it back to this community. You are the experts. You bring science to this. You, your voice is credible. Get in there and lobby. <clears throat> Thank you very much. There's everything to play for. Okay, please, Ben, you run a research institute. You want to just give me one second and tell me, how do you get these messages to the policymakers? Yeah, thank you very much. I think one of the things that comes out very clear is the aspect you are talking about the science policy interface. And one of the things we do is that in science, we generally uh, generate a lot of technological information, which does not really make sense to our policymakers. We ought and need to simplify. We need to actually come up with very clear messages that can be able to influence policy because policy want to get really the outputs on exactly how this can be able to do, rather than the actual science jargon that we generate. So simplifying and generating messages that can be accepted and policy messages will actually be able to re uh, uh, cover the gap between the science that we generate as well as you know, the messages the policies would be able to. So the aspect of packaging information generation and packaging and knowledge management is an important aspect that we need to be able to look at if, of course, you know, this is going to influence policy. Robert, do you have a, something you'd like to add to that? 
from the CCAF's experience? Yes, uh, just to emphasize that this is really a key challenge for scientists, how to bring and translate the scientific results in such a language that the policymakers can use it easily. Uh, this is really a key challenge. And we are always talking about mainstreaming climate change into development plans and so on and so forth. But how to do it? We never talk about that. And I think it is important that we develop some tools. In, and this is research. We have to develop some tools that, that really help uh, know what is the process that should really bring the scientific results to the decision makers. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay, I'm going to invite us to answer a few more questions. I saw a couple of hands coming up, but we've got to do this. This is part of our homework. So can we have the set of questions, please? Um, right, dry land forests are part of climate smart agriculture, perhaps. What is the most important change needed to take climate smart agriculture to scale? Is it more financing, more information, more coordination among government agencies, or is it better policies? You only get one choice and vote now, please. <laughs> All right. Better policies is the winner, but we also need coordination among government agencies. What I, and nobody's going to say we don't need financing, I'm pretty sure. So we have some on each of these, but what I saw was people didn't have, they didn't want to choose among them. We might need more than just one or the other. All right, let's go to the next question. Oh, this is how we look. All right. Oh, we're fairly evenly distributed among our questions, among our stakeholders. Excellent. Shall we go to the next question? Given experiences in your country, how would you rate the importance of devolving control over natural resources to local people as a way to improve woodland management in a way which builds resilience to climate shocks? Is it very important? Is it just important? Is it not important? Or I'm not sure. All right, very important. There seems to be some pretty strong agreement about the resilient side of the woodland management. Thank you very much. And let's see how we did. I think we should work together. Okay, let's go to the next question. Now, assuming that the rights to woodland resources are clearly defined, which of the following would be the best way to involve the private sector in improving woodland management and landscape restoration? In partnership with forest departments or other government institutions? In partnership with community-based institutions? In partnership with individuals? Any of one, two, or three. They're giving us some spread there. And lastly, the private sector is not an appropriate partner. Please vote. All right, so we think that it's in partnership one way or the other, um, and that with community institutions or among individuals, government institutions, and community institutions. There are a few of us that feel like private sector just shouldn't show up at this particular table. Do we see the distribution? Okay. All right, we've got lots of coffee talk to happen. All right, let's go to the last question. We've been talking about investments and the need for financing. So, which of the following climate investments would most effectively promote adaptation? For example, by improving household food security in dry woodlands. Should we improve access to markets and facilitate private investment? Should we improve access to technical assistance on integrating trees into our farming systems? Shall we institute a system of payments for environmental services? for carbon, or implement appropriate tenure policy reform. Please vote. <clears throat> All 
Okay. So we have a bit of a balance between improving access to our technical assistance to get those trees on farms and sorting out our tenure issues. And of course, we still think markets and payment for environmental services or rewards are important. We've got two quick questions we're going to register. I saw David, and then I saw Amos. And then we're going to come back and invite the panelists to make final remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Howard from University of Leeds, United Kingdom. I think it's also important we get agriculture in, in COP, but it's also looking at multi-track pro processes, getting more investment in climate smart agriculture and forestry outside, because we need much more investment we can get out of climate financing. So it was a question towards Andrew, but uh, it, it's just to say we need to get more investment full stop in better agriculture and better forestry, as well as a decision in, in uh, this COP. Okay, thank you. David, can we take this question here? Okay, oh, oh, what I've seen like in Kenya on uh, in agroforestry, what starts is like uh, policy and not research. Because uh, the landscapes we are talking about, the landscape we have destroyed. So it's a matter of reversing those landscape back not having new species like eucalyptus, plantation in the landscapes which have been damaged. So I would like to know the kind of research that uh, is being done on the species in relation to landscape uh, rehabilitation or uh, resilience landscapes. Thank you very much. All right, even though I couldn't lure you down, I've got um, two questions up here. We'll start here and go there, and then we're going to finish. Hear me? There we go. Um, I'd just like to suggest that maybe we can get over Red Plus a little bit and declare victory, because the drivers of deforestation, and agriculture is one of them, is clearly included in Red Plus in the decision. So I, I think we can sort of get past the fact that there's no explicit uh, recognition of agriculture in Red Plus and, and just take it as, as we're, we're in there because of the drivers. And secondly, I think that Red Plus is not the be-all and end-all of mitigation in agriculture. 95% of the emissions from agriculture are the non-CO2 greenhouse gases. Okay? Methane emission from enteric fermentation is number one. Nitrous oxide emission from fertilizers is number two. Methane from rice is number three. Manure management produces the rest. Red is not going to solve that problem. That's not the right mechanism for this. So let's get the mechanisms right and figure out just what we want. And I think if we can clearly articulate what it is we want to see in the work program, we'll, ha we'll have, uh, the ears will be turned towards us and they'll start listening. But as far as red, you know, let's take the, the, the driver's part and, and work on that and, and clearly explain what we can do about being part of that. And for the rest of the greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, let's figure out what the right mechanism is for dealing with it. I just don't think red is that mechanism. Can you identify yourself quickly, Lou? Yeah, my name's Lou Versho. I'm from C4. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, Edmund Barrow from IUCN. A couple of small little questions, mainly to Andrew. Uh, you talked about Africa knowing about adaptation. And I'm going to provoke and generalize a bit. How can we persuade African governments to know about adaptation in African drylands? Secondly, um, again, you, Andrew, you're from the World Bank, and also Peter Deweese from the World Bank. I was a bit surprised you didn't mention the Ministry of Finance or Macroeconomic Development, because those are the people who actually write the checks and make policy or who actually ultimately determine policy. At present, agriculture, et cetera, is a relatively important player. The environment and the forests are relatively weak players. How do we get them on a level playing field where we, where we acknowledge the real importance of all those goods and services you talked about, those $10 billion? billion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Okay, let's have a last round of comments from our very kind <laughs> speakers. You've just been given a lot more to think about because we had a set of questions where people made some um, statements by voting, but also then we had follow-up questions from relative to invest full stop, 
ensuring that ag and forestry and development were all going in a good direction. We had um, additional questions around red, additional questions around how do we make sure that the research is moving in the direction of resilience versus other ways of doing things. And then lastly, what about some of the other actors, the Minister of uh, Finance, for example. So, Robert, I'd like to start on your end, and I'm, asking, I'm gonna ask you to be as brief as humanly possible, as they say, brief as brilliant. And so, very short answers, and we'll just move down the line and we'll ask Andrew to finish up, because he got several of those questions. Very briefly, uh, for me, uh, there is no competition between scientists and farmers. We are all researchers. And farmers have the advantage to know better their, their environment. So I believe that we can always work together in order to come up with uh, options that really uh, uh, are very useful uh, for the ma main beneficiaries that are the, the farmers. So this is very important. Thank you. Yes, um, I do believe that um, priority attention should be uh, given to investing into people and their institutions. I, I think the um, example uh, that uh, has been uh, shown uh, from the Sahel, uh, starting from the Niger cases, shows the way uh, forward. Indeed, we need uh, more attention and uh, more contribution from, uh, from science and technology, but I think institutions and people deserve mm -hmm. pr uh, priority attention. Indeed, uh, uh, opening up um, the uh, uh, area of uh, uh, role of uh, other government institutions, I think, is also important, not just ministers of agriculture or, or uh, environment. But I think um, cross-cutting uh, uh, approach in, in involving, in, indeed, ministers of finance is important also. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mokhtar. Ben, please. Yes, I can be able to say that uh, on my part, the aspect of institutional strengthening is a very important one. But to respond to the question that had been actually asked in terms of research, we have quite a lot that has been done. What I would rather recommend is that let us build on the lessons learned. Because it's out of this particular lessons learned that we shall be able to pick the best practices and use these particular practices for purpose of scaling up. And in that way, we shall be moving in the right direction. Build on what we know. Okay, Andrew, you've got a few things to address, please. Uh, well, Ben and I were together doing shadow voting on all of those uh, same ones, and um, we agree with the majority, actually, so uh, you're right. Um, at least we think you are. Uh, but the striking thing was exactly what, what you said, which is how um, all, all segments sort of were, were shared equally. I mean, it wasn't like researchers are saying this, international institutions, NGOs, it was, which is actually very, very encouraging, I thought. I really want to agree with David's premise. I mean, D David said, hey, it's not just all about climate finance, what about regular finance? That's absolutely and utterly right. The plain fact of the matter is, though, that even an institution like the World Bank, and I think we probably provide more, outside of climate finance, we provide more financing for forests than any other institution, but it's only about $300 million a year. Um, and that's like 1% of our total financing worldwide. Now, why is that? The demand is actually not very great, actually. Now, obviously, we tend to provide loans, and so governments don't seem to think it's worth borrowing for this. The other reason, though, is that, quite frankly, um, the, the, the experience of, of forest programs has not been great. They tend to be slower. It's very hard to get, um, to get them sort of really on track. What I take from this, and I mean, I must say, I found this totally great, because, not what I said, but what, what you guys said, there, I, I'm sensing that we are making a lot of progress on learning things that work. I mean, all of you three said very, very positive things about examples of things that actually are working. So I'd make one other point, David. I think that climate finance has refreshed and excited the whole community. 
um, and whether that's FCPF or the FIP or UN Red or whatever, I think it's actually brought a lot of zip and it's brought a, a significant amount of additional resources. The, the really important thing is to use that limited climate finance to leverage a lot more finance. Um, that's what we're finding now is actually we're now providing more regular finance because there's climate finance. Um, I, I do want to agree with our friend up there from C4. I mean, it's, a, it's really a different whole set of issues, but I would love to have a session on that. But I don't want to go into detail, but I, I like your point. Finally, our friend from IUCN, you know, what are we doing to get ministers of finance on board? Um, it's absolutely vital. I think as a community, we have not managed to make it, um, as I said at the very beginning, to tell a, 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 a persuasive narrative that relates to the economy and a sustainable economy over time. I think we've made it sound too complicated, and it is very complicated. And what all around the world now, I mean, more than 100 developing countries are saying, look, we're really interested in this green growth thing. I mean, the Minister of Finance of South Africa, wonderful man, Praveen Gordon, he's always saying, show me the jobs that are gonna come out of this, and, and I will become the greatest champion. And I think what we need to do as a community is say, hey, actually dry land manage management, dry land forests are part of a green growth story that relates to livelihoods, it relates to jobs, it relates to really the, the core of development just as much as people that will be employed making solar panels, say, which is what everyone's talking about. So I think the burden is on all of us to make this whole story sing. And it seems to me that's what we're trying to do today. Thank you very much, Andrew. And can we give a round of applause to all of our speakers? And this has been a very high-powered session. It's a disappointment when we can't drill down into some of these topics, but some very serious things have been registered. And so we greatly appreciate that, but hope some informal conversations will follow it up. May I invite Peter DeWeese to please come up and close us out? Peter DeWeese from the World Bank. Thank you so much. Uh, I, it's a, a, a great pleasure to have been able to have host a session with uh, a shared session with FAO. And I'd like to close out by recognizing a few colleagues with FAO, Sue Bratz and Nora Baramuni, who have been really key in moving this agenda forward. They've been tremendous uh, and very helpful in doing that. I'd also very much like to thank our wonderful panel, uh, uh, Andrew, Ben, uh, uh, Robert, and, and, and Mokhtar and of course, uh, Constance Neely as well. 